ADF is very important because we view the fact that uh, young children need to get off on the right start to be very critical and helping train the people that get those children off on the right start is very important. We um, look at a range of issues, um, education policy all the way up through foreign policy. And in my role, I look at how education could be improved, especially for our youngest, from, uh, for those who are from zero to age eight, um, how we can make sure that our, our little ones have the best possible learning experiences. One of the things that I'll be talking about tonight is how we think about technology in the lives of young children. And my, um, the book that I'll be talking about tonight, my book Screen Time, goes into the research on what we know about how children's brains develop when they are in the face of media and how we may not need to be as scared of screen media as we might think, but we need to be a lot more mindful about how to use it and just really getting smart about what technology means in children's lives. Okay, what are some things that parents can do to use technology to help their little ones learn? Well, it can make a really big difference if you tune into the content of what's on the screen. So that means everything from starting to pay a lot more attention to the kind of TV shows that they're watching and look for those that are educational or designed for young children, all the way to um, playing with them when they're using apps on the smartphone, you know, um, engaging with them, having conversation about what they're um, experiencing, finding out what they like and what they don't like, and just having a lot of fun with your, your own child and conversing with your kids. All right, is there anything else you'd like to add? So the one other thing I was gonna mention is I always get asked, well, how much time should, say, a three-year-old spend with an iPad? And one of the big messages is that it can't be only about time. We have to look at what I call the three C's. Look at the content, as I just talked about, the context, you know, how is it fitting into a child's day? Are they getting a balanced diet of all sorts of different activities? And then the last the C is your individual child and what does he or she like to do? What upsets him or her? What is going to help her learn? What sparks her imagination? And once we get those three C's right, we'll be on a really good path for our kids. How long has Exxon sponsored these programs? Uh, this is the beginning of the third season that we've uh, sponsored ADF Speaker Series. Okay, what do you think the most important takeaway from these events is? Well, if I'll speak specifically about this one, the, uh, the topic today of how young children interact with media and the various screens that are put in front of them is obviously of increasing importance. Sharing that with teachers and parents is a, a critical issue. As we move into the actual program, um, there is one thing I was thinking of as well, and it's not necessarily a great lead-in, but I thought it made sense to me. I was watching LSU football. It's football season, right? And I don't care if you're in the South, it just not usually gender-specific, football's a big deal. And uh, it was on the SEC Network, uh, which is a pretty good little program to catch up sports if you want to watch things that are Southeastern Conference-oriented. I do not recall the, uh, the company placing the ad, which is probably a bad thing. But I do recall the content, and it's a whole content around how we in the South, particularly in football land, raise our kids to be fans. I don't know if you've seen it or not. They've got the, kid, the, the gentleman with his, uh, with his uh, excuse me for saying this, Alabama, hat on, and he's leaning over telling his kid in the crib, roll tide, right? Now you got the, the other person in, the, in their truck, SUV, and it's our opponent this weekend, and the kid's got the cowbell in his car seat, and the guy's ringing the cowbell, right? And I was just thinking, you know, at the end of the day, what we leave behind when we exit this great earth is the impact we have on others. And in football, we do that a lot. Who's our favorite sports team? What do we like? And, you know, if we could maybe harness that same attention at times and think about our kids' education, not just our kids, but others, what an impact we have. So thank you for being here because what this tells me is you care about what you leave behind as it relates to kids and their education, particularly around early childhood education, which is one of the things that ADF helps to work towards. Um, that's a big deal. It's a very big deal. So thank you much for that. So the next time you see that commercial, and you probably will, chuckle, particularly at the Alabama, the states, the Arkansas, and all those folks, right? But remember, for us, even more valuable is what we do for our kids around the topics like the one today. 
Um, with that, let me uh, recognize uh, a very important entity to ADF and to all that we offer in the Distinguished Speaker Series, and that's ExxonMobil, who is our pre presenting sponsor. They've been a great partner with us for years. Um, they very much value the very thing I just spoke of. Uh, and with that, I'm going to bring uh, Ken up, and Ken's going to introduce our speaker for this afternoon. Ken? My name is uh, Ken Miller. I'm the engineering manager for the ExxonMobil facilities here in, in Baton Rouge. And many of you probably know our company is very involved in education outreach and sponsoring this early childhood education lecture is something we're very proud of and we believe is critical to our community. This ADF partnership brings free education to the community and we're glad to once again be a part of sponsoring this speaker series. ExxonMobil's investment in education begins with our employees who have been working in Baton Rouge classrooms for more than 30 years. Each year our employees spend over 40,000 hours volunteering in the community, many of those directly in the classroom interacting with, uh, with our young children. From our engineers and scientists to the operators and our office staff, our ambassador teams use creative, hands-on lessons to show kids that math and science can be a lot of fun. We believe that exploring and exposing children to interactive math and science experiences from early childhood all the way to the university level is, providing, is critical to providing students with inspiration, motivation, and confidence to achieve goals. Today's speaker will share unique educational experiences and how they can help our youngest students. I now have the pleasure of introducing our distinguished speaker, Lisa, Lisa Guernsey. Lisa is an expert on early childhood development and directs the Early Education Initiative at the New America Foundation, which is a nonpartisan think tank in Washington, D.C. She focuses on how to scale up high quality learning environments for young children birth through age eight. Lisa will discuss her new book, How Electronic Media, From Baby Videos to Educational Software, Affects Your Young Child. In it, she focuses on infants to five-year-olds and goes beyond the headlines to explore what exactly is educational about educational media. So with that said, it's my pleasure to present Lisa Guernsey. So what I'm going to do today is talk uh, with you about a journey that I took as a mom and as a journalist and as a researcher. And it's a journey that started with a lot of questions about how technology is affecting the way our children grow up. And um, I took this journey myself, feeling like I might get a little scared by the answers. Um, but as I hope you'll find and, and agree with me about, it turns out it's maybe not so scary once we understand what's going on. So I'll just start with a little bit more about me, just so you have a sense of kind of where I'm coming from. Um, I actually live in Virginia. I was, was raised in Virginia. Um, and I direct this program at the New American Foundation that looks at early learning environments for kids. But I also um, am a reporter and a journalist. And I started as a reporter and um, had been writing about technology and education for gosh, almost almost uh, 20 years at this point. Um, I was at the New York Times as a technology reporter when my first uh, baby was born. And there were a lot of questions swirling around in my mind as I was both mothering an infant and looking at all of the new technology that was coming our way. And these are my two girls who um, bared with me as I was working on this book. The one thing that was just so um, really struck me as I became a mom was that I, I thought, I mean, I was a technology reporter for the New York Times. I thought I had a handle on what technology meant to children's learning. And then these guys appeared in my life. And it was a whole new world in terms of the kinds of questions I was asking. And they were questions that were centered on what seemed to be incredibly simple pieces of technology, like a video screen, and what children even understood when they looked at a video screen. So that's where we'll start our journey. But first, I want to also find out a little bit more about you. 
So if you, if you bear with me for a moment, I'm going to quiz you a little bit, and you can answer by just you know, raising your hand. And we'll just get a sense of um, who's in the room and what areas of interest um, you may have that can help to guide me in this presentation. So I first just wanted to find out, among everybody out there, how old are the children in your life? Um, and I don't mean just, you know, those of you who are parents with kids at home, but maybe your grandparents or your teachers or your tutors. Just think about the, the children that are kind of closest to you right now and what their ages are. So how many of you have infants in your life? Okay, well, that's a good number of you out there. Hopefully getting some sleep for those of you who are parents. Um, how many of you have toddlers? Okay, yes, a lot of toddler, toddler parents and young parents and educators. Preschoolers? Great. And how about in the early elementary age, five to eight? Okay, fantastic. So a nice range actually here. And, and the book, the research I did for the book was primarily from zero through age five, although there are a couple of um, points in the book where I'm talking about research for older kids. But since then, I've also done a lot more study and research on children um, in the early elementary years. So we started to kind of move up with my kids as they're aging and, and having a million questions about them and what they're going through. Um, and this topic, the topic for today is not just the topic of my book, uh, which is screen time, but is really about reading and how children learn to read and what it means to be literate and to teach the skills that lead to a literate society in the 21st century. And I know that so many of you are deeply interested in and committed to education. So I think you probably share with me an understanding that that is a really critical question for our country, to understand how the next generation will learn to read, given everything that they're coping with right now. Another quiz for you. Talk, thinking about the screen media that might be in your children's lives, just think back to yesterday for me. And raise your hand if the children in your lives were interacting with or watching um, TV or DVDs yesterday. Good number of you. How about video games? And don't be shy, because honestly, if, if I remember thinking this myself as a parent, like I'm not sure I want to admit that I'm like watching TV. You'll see as as I continue with my presentation, it is not all bad. It is not all bad. Okay. How about video games via yeah, console? I'm thinking like Xbox, the Wii. Great. Okay. Packaged computer software. This is something that's not as readily available anymore. Jumpstart, things like that. All right, I only have a couple of you on that one. How about apps on a tablet or a smartphone? Okay, yeah, like half the room at least, right? And then what about just looking at video clips or photographs on a computer or a tablet? Yeah, okay, majority of you guys. All right, all right, one last question. Just in your own opinion, based on kind of what you've seen of your children, what do you think is having the biggest impact on their reading or their early literacy skills if they're not yet reading, just on their kind of language and literacy skills? So I'm just going to read these out first so you can kind of think about the options here. Is it the time with books? Is it their conversations with you or other family members? Uh, is it their opportunities to play literacy games or, or reading games? Is it the educational shows on TV that are focused on things like learning um, letters, sounds, reading? Or is it their teachers? So let me just, and, and feel free to kind of choose two if you want. But just think about kind of what's kind of primary in your mind. How about time with books? Good, a good number of you in the room. Gosh, almost half maybe. Conversations. Great. Opportunities to play reading or literacy games. A few of you. And then educational shows on TV, couple, three or four. And how about the te their teachers, your children's teachers? Okay, a good number there too. Great, okay, so we're gonna try to hit on all of these topics as I'm going through this presentation. And we'll have time for questions as was described earlier. Um, so please feel free to write down things as they're coming to you. So as I pointed out, um, we're at a really kind of a, a big moment when it comes to technology. It's basically raining down on home. Um, interactive media of all kinds is, is everywhere, right? And as a parent, I certainly can feel sometimes like I'm just literally awash in it in trying to understand the best ways to navigate 
um, through it. The dilemma for our day is that as it becomes more and more important for our children to grow up literate, to really be able to read, and that means not just reading text, but really really reading, understanding information, being able to process it. This is also the day and age for our children when they are, there are so many distractions that might keep them from what we have traditionally understood as the primary environment they need to become readers. So we are in a, we're in a pickle. <laughs> if we need these, we need our children to become readers and yet, and in part because of all the technology around us, and yet the technology around us may be um, leading that to be harder and harder for them. So one of the things that I've been doing is looking at this historically and trying to understand how even just video has had an impact on the way children learn. And it's been really interesting to look at what happened with TV. So this is a graph that's describing or showing you the adoption of television sets in American households. So on our y-axis here is the percentage of households in the United States, and then across the bottom are the years since first commercial availability. So somewhere in that um, middle range, you know, somewhere in the, the, the 40s or so, when things people were really starting to buy up TV sets. And as you can see, the adoption rate was really quick. It did not take long for 90% of American households to have a television. There's something so powerful about the technology of video and bringing video into the home. There was a famous speech in 1961 that many of you may know of, maybe you remember, um, called the Vast Wasteland Speech. And it was given by Nell Minow, who was with the uh, Federal Communications Commission. And in it, he basically said, I'm looking out there, and television it looks like a vast wasteland to me very critical about the content on TV and the way people were using television. It wasn't until a few years after that that we got around to finally trying to think about TV as it pertains to kids. It wasn't until the late 1960s that we finally got around to thinking about something like Sesame Street and using the technology, the new technology of the time, to really engage children in learning. So, what about now? This is what's going on now. The apps are everywhere. This is a graph that's showing adoption, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, availability of apps in the iTunes store from 2008 to 2012 um, and the steep, steep curve in terms of the number of apps available. This got us up to a little under 700,000 today. Actually, it's more than this today, but as of last count, it was more than a million apps available. And this is smartphone adoption in our country. We are on the same curve that we were on with television. Smartphones will become as ubiquitous as TV sets. And for those of us in the you know, generation kind of under 50, we kind of already feel like they are. Um, there's some, some good studies out of Pew Internet like uh, survey projects that show that um, in the younger generations, it's you know, well over 80% who own smartphones today. So my question that I've kind of been grappling with in writing the book, but also since then, is are we gonna be able to have a Sesame Street moment? Can we take a minute, maybe earlier than Sesame Street, where we can say, well, oh, wait a second, can we really use these new tools to help children learn to understand the technology well enough to do so? you a video, before we kind of try to answer that question, I want to show you a video that I just think raises all sorts of interesting questions. But before I do, I want to ask if any of you have heard of Talking Tom, an app called Talking Tom. A couple of, maybe not everybody, two of you, okay. I'm going to describe it to you. Talking Tom is an app um, that you can get for any tablet out there. And he is a Tom cat, he's a little animated cat. Basically what he is is a piece of software that hears and then spits back what he's heard. Records and plays back, okay? 
He is loved by my children. Loved by my, I mean, this we're talking, they can spend hours with this, you know, this animated animal. And if you go on YouTube, there are all sorts of fun videos of little kids playing with this app. So I just wanted to play this one for uh, us to enjoy and then to think about as I'm going through some of the research on language building and literacy learning. Too, or some, I mean, there's some really big questions that come to mind, especially the more we understand how children build language development that um, are both scary and have some potential uh, as we look at this. So I'm going to come back to this video, but you can have that in your mind. So the first thing I think we need to do if we kind of want to get smarter about what technology, especially screen media, means in the lives of today's kids, we need to understand how the human brain learns from the screen, learns from two-dimensional information that's constantly changing or moving. And this means that we have to, this is what I try to do as a reporter, is kind of put some of our assumptions to the side and go and look at what the research actually says about how children learn in general and then how they can learn from these kind of 2D media oriented environments. So to do that, I, um, I asked a number of questions and I went out to developmental psychic labs around the country. I met with neuroscientists and cognitive scientists. I visited early childhood labs and early literacy experts and went on home visiting visits with social workers. And um, I mean, just the blacks actually. I talked to all sorts of speech therapists and found that, wow, I don't have a lot of assumptions in my head that um, actually could be overturned by the research. So I'm going to take you through a couple of them. There are assumptions I wrote about in a piece for um, a website called NAEYC for Families. NAEYC stands for National Association for the Education of Young Children. I'm not going to go through all of them, but a few of them. And these are all things built on um, the research that's in the book. So the first assumption. As long as the content is educational, as long as what they're seeing on the screen is educational, it's going to be good for children. And what I found was that it really, the content absolutely matters. There's no question about it, and that's, that's more and more apparent as we do research. But that we can't just assume that just because something kind of looks like it was um, made with good intentions, that children are actually going to learn anything from it. So I want to tell you a story about some research on Clifford the Big Red Dog. So everyone out there know Clifford. It's on PBS. It's like an animated dog. Um, there's all sorts of kind of pro-social messages that come out of this TV show. It's been on for years. And uh, the dog's like bigger than a house, right? And 
One of the episodes of Clifford is about a three-legged dog who comes to town, and the other dog aren't really sure about the dog with only three legs. And um, by the end of the show, though, they realize that it doesn't matter. We still can be friends, and they you know, have a big party. And the, these researchers, the University of Wisconsin, wondered, do kids really get that message? To us as adults, it's like really obvious. It's almost saccharine. It's just, you know, um, like, OK, what are we, you know, I get it. Tolerance, acceptance. But do children really understand that? So the researchers had, um, this, in this case, it was kindergartners and a little bit older, come and watch the show. And then they asked them questions afterwards. And they compared some of their answers to, questions to children who had not watched the show. And what they found was highly alarming, because what they found is that the children, after watching the show, were less tolerant of people who were different than those who had. Why is that? What a head scratcher. And they, <laughs> the, the uh, researchers went back to the show to look at it much more closely. And what they found was that the first 20 minutes was all about the dogs having a lot of hesitation and fear about this three-legged dog. And their expressions on their faces were kind of scared and they would shrink back away from the dog. And they would kind of um, hold their hands and wonder if they should get close to the dog. And only the last five minutes of the show were the happy parts, the, the moments of reconciliation and acceptance. And the theory is that at that age, children were still processing all that emotion at the beginning of the show. There was a lot of fear, a lot of hesitation, a lot of, I don't know if I should. And it's a lot to ask that children would kind of snap out of that in just five minutes and still like, understand. So this, these kinds of messages are being um, understood and turned over by people who are developing media for young children. And they're like, wait, we need to be a little more careful and understand what's going on in the mind of a five-year-old, what's going on in the mind of a four-year-old, a three-year-old, and especially now that we're getting down to apps and baby videos for kids at two, two or younger, what do they really understand? So, that was kind of one of my big takeaways, is that we can assume things might be educational, but we need to be a lot more discerning. We definitely need to look at the content of the show, no doubt about it. But we have to be careful, because children don't always learn what the program creators intend. And sometimes they may actually learn the opposite. Now, this doesn't negate the really, really good research that's come out of many programs that are designed for young children. And many of these are programs that have research directors on staff who know how to design curriculum, where they can step-by-step -step really teach children lessons. And so up here on screen right now are a few of the characters from some of those shows that have some quite solid research behind them, research that's not just company, not just the company line, but was done by independent um, academics. One of those is Super Y, which is on PBS still today. In fact, it's fairly new. Um, it's been around for about five years. And they've been testing Super Y, uh, which is a show about reading and, and learning early literacy skills, to see whether it might make a difference for kids who um, grew up in poverty or who are in pretty disadvantaged circumstances, don't have a lot of books at home, etc. And what they found is that um, it made a big difference for kids. Just three to four episodes of watching this show because it had been designed specifically to be understood by three, four, and five-year-old children um, was helping those kids learn some of these skills like phonics and um, letter identification. Now we're in a world of interactive media. So I want to tell you one more research study story um, that gets us into the world of iPads and touch screens. And in this story, um, I'm going to tell you about these three puppets that are on the screen here. They're called the Curious Buddies puppets. They're from a show that Nickelodeon tried and kind of flopped um, about 10 years ago. Um, but they're still quite cute, and they're used by researchers at Georgetown University. And what the researchers there did was they took um, one of the episodes from this TV show on Curious Buddies and these puppets, and they decided to find out whether children would learn more from watching 
seen in video using these puppets, or would they learn more from an interactive game where it's almost the same as watching the scene, but where children had to press a button to make something happen in the, in the scene. So their experiment was set up to figure that out, and the way they did that was to have children, these were three-year-olds, watch a scene that looked kind of like this. This is the laundry room. You can tell it's like what that basket back there and the little puppets. And then I, the idea was to have children watch on video or through the game. And then the third option was they would actually watch it live through a window that was cut out to be the exact same size as the, uh, as the video screen. And then they took the children into a room that was this room, exactly designed the same as the scene on TV. And they said, now what you saw on the screen was these puppets hiding behind various things. Can you transfer your learning? Can you go and find those puppets in the real world? So it was a pretty cool test, and the kids had a blast doing it. Um, and the results, the results were that um, the kids who watched the video version, the three-year-olds, they went into the room then to try to find these puppets, and they did not know what to do. It was like they hadn't even seen the video. And the kids who watched through the window, who watched it in person, they made a beeline. They knew exactly where to go. They knew exactly to you know, go behind the pants, and they would find the green puppet. And the last one, the kids who did the interactive game, they acted much more like those children who had seen it in person. They were the ones that were able to go and find. They didn't seem as lost. They were able to go and find the puppets. So this was one of the very first studies. This came out in 2010. It was one of the very first studies to show that there might be something going on there with interactivity. That children can have that kind of agency where they're actually making something happen. Are their minds kind of more engaged in what they're learning? Or are they able to kind of do things at their own pace? Well, whatever it is, there are a lot of theories but something about that experience was more apt to help them learn from what they saw. Okay, so that's all about the educational content area. And I get asked all the time, okay, Lisa, those are interesting, okay, you not know about the studies in Georgetown, but just tell me what shows to watch. Just tell me what apps, just tell me. And I get this question, I've been getting this question for years, and every year it changes, so I can't answer this question. Instead, I can give you the tools to figure this out for yourselves. And that tool is this mnemonic that I've created called SQLEARN. And these are just some things that you'll want to look for in the content for kids. And this primarily is related to the research on kids from three to five years old. Some of it applies to two-year-olds. Um, it gets a little different when we start getting up into the ages of six to eight. But essentially, they are look for straight line storytelling. There's research that shows children don't really follow what's going on when, it, when the plot line bounces around a lot, there's a reason that Dora the Explorer is so popular. It is because Dora goes from point A to point B. And there's a map that shows you exactly where she's going. The kids, kids understand it. They actually can follow what Dora is doing. So you want straight line storytelling. You want participation. That goes to that interactivity moment. Um, that can also include participation in a, in a show like the Blue's Clues, where the, the character on the screen pauses for a moment to try to elicit some sort of answer from the audience. You want labeling on screen, and that's, that's what we also want in any good teacher, right? We want someone who is on screen recognizing the child might not know all the vocabulary words you're using and might point to something to say, yes, hey Jimmy, you're kicking those stones. That's that, that gravel there on the driveway, that gravel needs to stay in the driveway. They have actually just used and pointed to a word gravel that might not have been understood by that child before. So if you're watching a show with a child or, or seeing a game with them that doesn't help a child learn new vocabulary words, um, you're missing an, an opportunity for kids um, to really point that out. The E is for engagement, which is kind of an obvious one. Kids need to be interested in what they're doing. The R is for repetition, review, and routine, which we see in a lot of good programming out there for children. It's really designed for children today. 
And then the N is for nonviolence. And I just wanted to put an exclamation point on that one. There's a really solid research that shows that young children will imitate what they see on screen. They also, of course, will imitate what they see in person, in real life, in person. But if a child sees a cartoon of a boy grabbing another boy by a sweatshirt hood and pulling him across the playground, well, highly likely that that will be imitated and tried out later. Whether the child even knows why or what's going on, it's almost like in our human nature to try and to imitate what other human beings around us do or what other characters we relate to do. So, um, and many preschool teachers I've talked to, they, they see actions on the playground that they just they know they're coming out of cartoons that kids watch and they just wish the parents could just turn those cartoons off or turn towards non-aggressive content. Another big assumption out there is that the TV, when, I'm, when a child is not watching it, that the TV is um, not really affecting a child. And this was a big one for me as a mom. I kind of was like, you know, I want to watch Food Network. And my kids aren't really paying attention to it, so I'll just kind of keep that on. Um, so yeah, on that one, I started reading the research and I was like, yeah, I don't like this answer. Um, but it turns out that we have some really good um, science now showing that even if a child is not tuned into the TV set, or even looking at it, or even looking like he or she's affected at all, there's something going on. It's affecting the way that they play, and it's affecting the way they interact with others around them. There's a study at the University of um, Massachusetts that showed um, that when Jeopardy was on in the background, uh, children changed the way they played. Instead of focusing in on one toy, they would bop from one toy to another to another as if they couldn't really pay attention to the one toy that they were playing with. So that's that assumption that the, the research is kind of overturning, that the shows in the background might be impacting the child more than you think. Another big one is about really little kids, about our babies and our, and our infants and our toddlers. And that is that all media for children under two is damaging. And this is an assumption that um, comes out of a very good-hearted um, effort to ensure that we understand the research on how babies learn. And the research on how babies learn shows that social interaction is a key ingredient. If they have someone in their lives that they can have a back-and-forth conversation with, they feel like someone's responding to them, that is building their brain, it's building those neurons. Um, and enabling them to make connections for learning. But it isn't necessarily the case that just because there's screen media in the life of a two-year-old, that that two-year-old is going to be hurt by it. There's a lot of context that we have to understand here. So the research essentially says this, make sure that screen time leads to social interactions and avoid exposing any children to adult-directed programming. So that first part, I want to talk about a little bit more, or both of them, actually. Um, so before age two, as I've said, we know that those interactions are so important. There's attachment theory out there that shows how much babies need to feel a bond with the person who's caring for them. And we, um, know how much they can learn from just a simple, even if they're not talking yet, just a simple, you know, responding to their cues and their babbling. It's huge for building babies' brains. Um, but that can happen in response to all sorts of things in a baby's environment. And one of the questions that I've had as I go through the literature is what happens when there's a video of Old McDonald had a farm and a mom folding laundry while the video is running is cooing, interacting and singing with her baby. That kind of experience is a social interaction for that child, maybe a very positive one. It could even lead to singing Old McDonald had a farm when they're, you know, heading to the grocery store later that day. 
So do we want to completely close down all media experiences? I think we have to be really, really thoughtful about how we're using screen media with, with babies under two. The American Academy of Pediatrics guidance is to, they, they recommend to avoid uh, screen time for children under two. They're focused primarily on children being left by themselves with media because there is very little research on whether children just passively viewing something, even if it's designed to be understood with like the baby video, there's very little research showing they can actually learn from that before age two. There are a couple of studies that have some interesting findings that might lead us to think maybe it's 20 months instead of 24 months, but there's still not much evidence that children before the age of two are learning much if it's just them alone with the screen. It's also important to understand that adult-directed programming, I'm talking about like the news or TV dramas or soap operas, that that kind of um, content, which really doesn't make any sense for children, because they're not, it's not designed to make sense for them, but that kind of content um, has been shown to lead to, and this is gotta be a little careful here, because it's an association, we don't know what's causing what, but that there's a link between children who at very young ages watch a lot of that kind of programming and then that those children at age four and their ability to focus on tasks and pay attention and regulate their emotions and things like that. Um, and so there's a lot more to unpack there to understand what is it about the households of children who are watching a lot of those kind of adult directed programming. Um, but there's enough to have certain experts quite worry about kids being kind of left with watching soap operas all day long, or even just having you know, the news um, on, or Jeopardy on all day long, etc. I'll get to the SpongeBob experiment later. Last um, of the assumptions is about e-books. Within this day and age, e-books are absolutely there. They're on our, they're on our smartphones for downloading, they're on our tablets. Um, as you know, Barnes & Noble has the Nook, um, which has a lot of color Colorful children's uh, children's books, illustrated books, beautiful books actually out there. And right now, the Nook is experiencing some some uh, some problems, and it may not survive. But the concept of seeing e-books um, and reading children's books on a device that that concept is not going away. And so, for years now, there has been a discussion of whether that's even a good idea, whether young children should even have. Um, are we reading ebooks? There was one study that showed that parents acted differently when they used ebooks with kids than if they used print books. When they used ebooks with children, the parents would say things like, Don't touch that. No, 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 click, click here, click here. And when the parents were reading print books with kids, they would say, What do you think is going to happen next? Or, Do you like your cat? Things that were actually about the content of the story. So there's been some concern that even parents may not know how to handle ebooks, essentially. So I say all that, and yet there is some very interesting research that shows if we treat ebooks much more like print books, if we recognize how much that social interaction matters, the way we can talk to our children about the content on the screen, sit with them together, then they can learn as much from that experience as with the print book. So the answer really right now is that it's all about how the ebooks are used. You have to really think about that kind of content. It basically means that everything we know about reading a print book with a child, we need to remember and apply to reading or playing with screen media with the child. Think of it all as media and the way we interact with it makes a huge difference in how children learn. I like to think about my kids growing up in a books plus world. I want books everywhere for them, but I recognize that there's gonna be a lot more the, uh, different types of information that are coming at them, and I want them to know how to understand that too, how to be critical thinkers about all of that as well. So I wanna model that behavior for them. All comes down to, here's kind of the big takeaway that I try to thread through the book. 
a way to just sum all this up is that instead of just thinking about screen time as time, worrying about it should be one hour or two hours, it's too much time with the iPad, instead of that, we should be thinking about the three C's. The first C is content. The second C is context, how we're using media with our children, how it fits into their day. And the third C is the child, the individual child, because we have so much uh, more research to do on how children from diff diff with different temperaments, different dispositions, special needs, coming I mean, from different backgrounds, how they are understanding and learning from media. And this is a ton, there's just a huge gaping hole in the literature there. For the most part, a lot of this research has been done on white middle class kids. We don't have a good handle on kids across the uh, socioeconomic spe spectrum, and we certainly don't have a very good handle on kids with special needs. Uh, yeah. So, when you think about this little guy and everything I was just talking about, there are some reasons to get a little worried. Um, get a little worried, and maybe we talk in the discussion um, a, a, a bit more about this, but here's the one that's kind of paramount for me. The more I look at how much an interaction with a caregiver, an adult parent, how much that builds children's brain, helps them learn, the more that I look at that video and I see this little guy and how desperate he is for that interaction. He wants to hear Talking Tom talk back to him. He's just crying for, he wants that kind of response. But what he's getting in response has no meaning. Has no meaning. So, not that, you know, I'm like saying don't ever use talking time, but just it's an it's a interesting way to think about how we want to use media with our children. So what are the implications for reading? And this is kind of where I'll, I'll close up for, for this evening and we will I'm really excited to hear your questions. I've been taking this research and, um, and trying to build toward a new research project on what does all this mean about our children as readers today? And what does it mean to be literate? And how do we need to change the way we're even approaching our educational institutions and our preschools and our child care centers and everything to help better understand um, what kids are going to need and to be readers in the 21st century? So I've um, undertaken a project at New America called Seeding Reading. And uh, our partner in, the, in this project is the Joan Hans Cooney Center at Sesame Workshop. It's a, uh, a, a section of Sesame Workshop that's completely separate from any of the Sesame products. It's a research arm that's just looking at how to harness new technologies in ways that are developmentally appropriate and based in sound research. And we, uh, we got some funding from the Pritzker Children's Initiative to embark on this last year. And we are collecting stories from around the country. We're visiting um, early childhood centers, going out um, to home visiting programs, and um, also doing a big analysis of the app's marketplace to find out what parents today are facing when they open up their, you know, their smartphone, their, go, to the, go to the app store, and go to the education category, and then they're just awash in different options, and they're not maybe sure what to pick or why. So we're looking at what has been called a literacy app, or what is called a reading app, and then we're going to analyze what are the features within those apps, and how do they compare to what we know children really need to learn how to read. And there's some um, early insights from this. This is all going to culminate in a book. And the book that will come out next year, you guys get a sneak peek at some of our early findings here. So one thing that we've done is just looked at, well, wait a second, how many apps are focused on literacy anyway? And, um, and how many are focused on literacy for really young children? And it turns out it's a lot of them. A lot of them out there. So we looked at, this is paid apps, meaning apps that you have to pay for. We have all sorts of different ways we're cutting the data. We looked at the apps you have to pay for, and we looked at those in the education category aimed at children, young children. And of those, 
we found that about a third to 43% are claiming to be literacy apps, to be helping children learn to read. So it's a pretty big chunk. We also have been looking at, based on the way these apps describe themselves, we've been looking at what kind of skills they are claiming to be able to teach. And some of them are, um, some of them are more nefarious than others. Some of them aren't like, cleaning in any kind of um, negative way. They're just simply saying, these are some features that can, we think can help your children. And there's a big array of um, difference there between, there's some apps that are designed by folks who really understand early literacy, and there's some apps that are designed by guys trying to make a buck. And sometimes it can be hard to tell what's what. Uh, but we have been seeing different features in these apps, everything from apps trying to teach grammar um, all the way to just your basic kind of alphabet knowledge and letter sounds. And so if you see on this, um, this graph here, right now we're looking at Amazon, Google Play, and the iTunes marketplace. And we're seeing some variation, but certainly a lot of apps out there are um, teaching or purporting to teach the ABCs. And surprisingly, a large number now are also um, working on vocabulary, which is different than when we started this project. In 2012, our data didn't show many apps at all during vocabulary. They're mostly just flashcards, ABC flashcards. Um, so we're going to keep picking apart this data. We're going to be um, actually testing some of the apps to see whether what they describe themselves as being is to match what they actually do. And um, stay tuned for the results. This is where we're, we're putting the information from this project on our website. Um, it's edcentral.org slash seating reading. And here are just the last three stories that we've put up on the website so far. Everything from ebooks, the app store. We focused on a program in Maine that's doing really interesting things with the iPad. iPad and cardboard boxes and kind of mixing the two of them together. Um, so uh, I'm excited to see what will come out of this. So let me just lastly leave you with some maybe ideas for what you can do as you're working with the children in your lives um, based on the research that we know now. And the most important thing is to do this, is to be together as much as you can with your kids when they're using media. And I know it's, I, and, and to interact with them around it and ask them questions and hear them ask questions. And I say this as a mom knowing that that's really hard to do. I would come home from work exhausted. Exhausted. I didn't, or, or in the days that I was at home with them all day long, oh my God. Of course there's going to be moments where you want to just say, please, God, can you just put on Hooker the Big Red Dog and just, or Super Wide or whatever. And, and of course, like all parents are going to need some, some time. But where we can, let's just not forget that media can be like that book reading experience and try to make it as much as possible like that for our kids so that they're seeing us ask questions about the media, so that they're becoming you know, critical thinkers and smart users of it. There's also some really good resources out there and um, I'm not happy to, some of these are actually on a handout that's on my website and then I've fleshed them out with some more here. I'm happy to send this list around um, as well if it's helpful. But one of the things I want to make sure everyone knows about is Common Sense Media. Um, it's a website out there that's designed for parents to help you navigate everything from like the movies that are out this week and whether a PG rating is really, you know, so a PG-13 really is PG-13. Everything from that all the way down to apps that are designed for two-year-olds and whether they're actually doing what they say they're doing. So. It, I think it's a good place to go. There's a lot of other places for educators out there um, to look at. Um, the second one on this list is ELLE, the Early Learning Environment from the Fred Rogers Center. Uh, Fred Rogers Center is the center in, in Pittsburgh. It's based on Mr. Rogers and Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. And they have some really beautiful videos of examples of how to use media with young children, but also how to get out in the yard and dig up worms and bake cupcakes and then make videos of that and then show that kind of media creation and, and show kids how to do it. And then there's a couple of new books out uh, for those of you who are 
kind of like me geeking out on this on this subject. Uh, Born Reading just came out from Jason Boo. He's got a whole section in there on ebooks and reading ebooks um, with with little ones. And then technology and media, technology and digital media in the early years has come out for educators um, from the um, NAEYC and it's going to be distributed nationally to everyone, all the preschool teachers in the country who are part of that, um, who are members of the NAEYC, the National Association for Education of Children. So that's it for now. I'm really, um, thank you for the time uh, and your attention today. I'm really looking forward to the questions because it's often the questions that we get into the, the meat of it all. Um, and I just want to say thanks again. Thanks to ADF for having me.